Welcome to the Jerusalem Lights podcast with Rabbi Chaim Richman, whose goal is Torah for everyone. I'm your co-host, Jim Long, and now, Rabbi Chaim Richman. Shalom, James D. Long. Shalom, Rabbi. Manashma. Baruch Hashem, how are you? Baruch Hashem, I'm doing very well. As we start the month of Tammuz, right? Yes, tonight yes. begins the month of, of Tammuz, which is a... Um, I'll just tell you right out. It's a difficult month. It's a mm-hmm. it's a month of um, oh, it's a heavy month. It's a it's a month of harshness because it is um, uh, well. First of all, on the seventeenth of Tammuz, which is observed later in the month, that's a fast day, uh, which begins the annual three week cycle of mourning for the destruction of the temple. That's the day that the uh, Oh, the uh, walls were breached, and the um, of the city, and the uh, uh, this led to the final destruction of the temple on the ninth of Av. And uh, there's a backstory, a kind of a history to the month of Tammuz, which is that, uh, which goes back to last week's Torah portion. Right, it goes back to last week's Torah portion of the of the spies, because yeah. the spies left the camp of Israel at the end of Sivan, and they returned on the 8th of Av, the, the, the right prior to the, the evening of the 9th of Av, and that's when they delivered their evil report, and people were crying the whole night, and that became the night of crying. So the point is that they were away for a couple of days in Sivan, and a, a, a week and a couple of days in Av, but the entire month of Tammuz was taken up by the walking, the excursion of the spies. So because that was so, um, you know, it, it just made such a cosmic imprint on the month, their, their um, occupation with, with seeing the land of Israel in a bad way, mm-hmm. which is very something that we can really relate to today. That, that really tainted the month of, of Tambos, besides the fact that there's a concept that when a tragedy begins, it's the, it's the worst part of the tragedy, the beginning. So the beginning of the of the end of the destruction of the temple is begins in the month of, of Tammuz, and then it, it climaxes on the ninth of Av. And but then afterwards, you know, from the fifteenth of uh, of Menachem Av on, the fifteenth of Av is a is a, a holiday in the time of the temple, and then the 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 second half of the month of Av kind of straightens out and is sweetened, and it becomes kind of like an uh, like a um, like a process that leads to the high holy days, to Elul and to Tishrei. But the point is the month of, of Tammuz is a time of, of severity because of the spies and, and because of the impact that that had on, on history. And then there's a, there are many more interesting ideas about the month of Tammuz, one being that it is associated with the tribe of Ruvain, yeah. And the tribe of of Ruvain, because you know, each one of the of the twelve months is associated with one of the twelve tribes. Exactly. So the tribe of, of Ruvain is is uh is associated with Tammuz and Ruvain, the root of that word is sight, vision. And it goes back to Leah when she named her child Ruvain. She said, Because Hashem has seen my my plight. So Ruvain, Resh Aleph Vav, Bet Yud Nun is about Riya, about seeing. And indeed, the spies were looking the whole time at the, at the land of Israel. So on the practical level of tikkun, because everything in this world is about our opportunity that Hashem gives us all the time to rectify and to be working towards fixing the energies. So on the practical level, the, the, the service of God that, that is uh, the compelling service that is really um, needed during this month is to look positively yeah. to undo the, the bad looking of uh, the bad evil eye as it were of the, of the spies. And that means a lot of things. It, it means because, you know, as we learned in Parshat Shalak, their whole vision thing was so negative. It was so skewed. It was so negative and it was so self-defeatist. So first of all, we have to look at ourselves positively. Second of all, we have to look at others positively. And the main aspect of the, of the fixed, sin of the spies that we can participate in this coming month of Tammuz, especially again, so relevant to our, to these days is to look at the land of Israel in a positive way. 
because there's so much negativity that's being spewed against the land of Israel, we can kind of do our best to to stem the tide of, the, of that by looking at Israel in a positive way. So this actually has a real practical applications for us. Last week's Parsha ends with the mitzvah of the tzitzit. There is a connection between the tzitzit and the sin of Korah, right? Yes, and I just must tell you <laughs> that I, I went into that at, in tremendous depth in this week's video ah, lesson. Okay, good. Parsha Korah. So I'm just giving you a heads up. I, I have never I have never presented it in I think in as clear a manner as we as we strove for in, in our video this week. So that will be up Bezrat Hashem uh, Thursday of this week. Yes, so I re I really tried to explore that on a on, on a level of depth that I've kind of never um never presented before. What's that all about? That very strange um, kind of story that our sages tell about, about a, a show that Korach put on yeah. by parading 250 of his followers who were very important people in talitot, in, in, in garments that were made exclusively of the sky blue. Yeah, the whole garment, not just the thread. The whole garment, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, I, so I went into that in, in, um, in very great detail, and it was, it was, it's really interesting. I tried to, ex to, the, to explain and to uh, talk about in this week's video the whole concept of Korach on a much deeper level, because, you know, here's a person who, by all measure was a great man with tremendous mm -hmm. potential for holiness. And uh, in fact, in, in life, uh, he had an appointment which was divinely um, appointed to him. He was one of the people who actually carried the Ark of the Covenant. Right. So he's not, he's not a slouch. He was a tremendous man. And yet he tripped up with something that became so uh, awesome, so nuclear in its, in its, um, um, and his impact that he that he, he started out ostensibly it seems like he was just kind of like uh, oh a social critic you know like he feels like Moshe and Aaron are taking too much responsibility for themselves and they should be more you know it's, it's almost as if he was like a community activist you know uh, in, in fact there's a, a very it's funny because there was a very incredible you, you know how like the Midrashim are so pithy and like in with the incredible timeless really timeless insight of the sages right mm -hmm. they could have, these things could have been said today the incredible depth of psychological insight so the sages point out this tradition that the night before korach's confrontation with moshe he went around to the entire camp of israel and he basically canvassed like baby kissing and like and like uh, like what do they call it? like back slapping? He went around to every single tent of every single Israelite, yeah. pressing saying, the flesh. Ex that's that's what I was looking for, pressing the flesh, saying to them, "Do you think I'm just doing this for myself? I'm doing this for you. Yeah, <laughs> it's not about me. It's like like the description of no, a, of a bottom politician. It's yeah, shocking. yeah. This is still going on today, and it started out as this thing. Like I say, what he's like some sort of a community activist. He's like, but what transpired very, very quickly is that it became clear that he, it wasn't at all about his jealousy of Moshe, which definitely stoked the, the flames and definitely uh, pushed him in the beginning. It was about his perception of God. And he, he, couldn't, he couldn't accept the fact that Moshe was appointed by Hashem. He, he felt that Moshe was making things up on his own. Mm-hmm. Like the whole business of the, and that's why it was important for Moshe to prove through the whole thing with the Ketor, with the incense and the almond blossoms that Hashem chose Aaron. Hashem chose Aaron, not he himself. He, he Moshe had no ego. It wasn't never about Moshe. He, even Moshe wasn't about Moshe. He could, he could have, it wasn't about him. Yeah. So, but, but what happened was that, that, that Korach demonstrated that he did not believe at all in the transmission of, of Torah from Sinai to Moshe. And more than that, he ended up basically denying that God even existed. So let, let's take it one step at a time. And, 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 and it's so amazing. But Jim, I have to tell you something. I don't know if you caught this news story. <laughs> this is just the most amazing thing. Probably wasn't, it wasn't reported, reported internationally because it wasn't such a big deal. But this week, just two days ago, on June 7th, right? A giant sinkhole opened up in Jerusalem. I never saw anything like it in my life. 
in the parking lot of Sharit Sedek Hospital. Wow. So uh, the news, the news, you know, like was reported and uh, we're watching it because there's security cameras and there's, you know, everybody's always recording things to this yeah. day and age. Some, somebody's always exactly where they have to be and there's security cameras. So as we're watching it, and it's what, what happened was they have a parking lot, which they've expanded recently. And there's a like a, a booth, you know, when you go in where the attendant sits or security. And as you're looking at this film, which is as if it's taken from a window of the hospital looking down, it starts to widen and a car falls into it. Oh, my. And then a huge palm tree falls into <laughs> it. And I'm thinking, oh. myself, is, is anyone is anyone aware of the fact that this is Parshat Korach? Yeah. That's amazing. This is like, anyway, it's, thank God there were no injuries whatsoever. Not yeah. one injury. But uh, like I say, at, le- at least one car fell into, I don't know how deep it was. Now, basically uh, at this point, they are saying that it was believed to have been formed as a result of nearby construction work for a new route at the entrance of Jerusalem. There's a tunnel under construction which also runs underneath the hospital and parking lot. So apparently it partially collapsed and uh, the hospital administrator immediately made it clear that the, you know, the hospital was not in danger. There was no one was in any danger, but we're looking at this pit growing. The walls of the pit are collapsing as we speak and cars are tumbling into it. And uh, <laughs> now already it became uh, what, what do they call that? A mem? Meme, how do you a, me, a meme, that? yeah, it's a meme, yeah. I'm so, I'm so uh, absolutely not socially, I'm, I'm socially awkward. But anyway, so now it's a meme and people are, are, are writing things uh, like, uh, if you go over to it, you can hear a voice coming up saying, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> Bibi is true and his government is true. And the reason for that is because there's a famous Chazal that says that Korach never died, as the verse right. says, and that he's down there today. today and that yeah. every 30 days, which by the way means Rosh Chodesh, according to Rabbi Nachman, the secret, every 30 days the world turns completely. And if you're in the right spot in the desert and you know where where uh, the opening is, you put your your ear down to the ground and you can hear Korach and his company saying, Moshe is true and his Torah is true and, and right. we're wrong. Anyway, so I'm thinking about all of this, <laughs> this incredible timing of, of this sinkhole. And I recall the interesting approach that the, the Rambam has regarding miracles. Mm-hmm. The Rambam writes about various miracles and he basically has this uh, approach to very scientific, you know, that um, whenever it's possible to explain a miracle as being a, a phenomena of science, then uh, do so. Uh, obviously there are some things that cannot be explained as, as rationally. And, and, but even, but his point is that even when something can be explained by science, it's still from Hashem, yeah. of course, you know, the Rambam, but what does he say? It's fascinating. He says, the issue is the timing. Mm, exactly. He, sa- he says it's a miracle of, the, and it can be explained, but what makes it a miracle is the synchronization of how Hashem, how Hashem does it. There's another opinion uh, of, a, of a different uh, great authority who maintains that, that, the, that the definition of the miracle really is that, also, also he says is the scientific um, explanation, but that it's kind of like before it's time. It's like something before it was discovered and, and understood. But I, I find the Rambam's approach to be fascinating Besides the fact that I was thinking about synchronization this week, because my goodness, is anyone even besides me thinking about the fact that that we're all looking at, at, with tremendous rapt wonderment at, at, at our beloved, familiar, all my children here were born in Shari Tzedek Hospital. We're looking at the, at the, and I was just there two weeks ago to visit a, a dear friend and the, and the parking lot is swallowing, swallowing up cars. Yeah. So that's synchronization. But the, the idea is interesting in, in that, um, I find year after year, I find that I'm so totally fascinated by the whole idea of Korach's punishment, which is so unprecedented and so totally uh, bizarre and extreme, you know, to be to be swallowed up uh, by the ground. And the more so when we think about the fact that which people don't emphasize. People talk about, you know, the verses in Torah and they try to understand deeply uh, what our sages teach about the concept of the mouth of the earth and, and, and him falling down. But what, what people don't 
uh, speak about, uh, which I think they should, the deeper even aspect of it is that he didn't die. And what does right. that mean? Because one might think, oh, that's cool. That's so great not to, not to die. But no, actually, that's, a, that's the worst thing of all in Torah. Everybody has to die. Yeah. Because in order for the neshama, in order for the soul to be reunited with the light of the Shekhinah, in order for a person to come to their ultimate tikkun before the resurrection, everybody has to die. So to be suspended like that, um, permanently, as it were. Um, and again, you know, you know that there's always, um, p- people have an issue when we study these things. Is this literal? Is mm-hmm. this just a metaphor? Is it literal? And what I try to emphasize again in our video this week is it matters not because it's a vehicle that our sages use. You're not, you're not supposed to take Midrash literally, but it's a, it's a powerful tool for us. To, it's a device for us to understand a life-changing lesson. And the idea of Korach being swallowed up permanently is the idea that he came to a place because of his own, his own ill will and his own uh, ego, he came to a place where he could receive no resolution. And that's, that's the worst thing of all. The, the whole act itself speaks of, as you said, it's a measure for measure uh, judgment on Korah and his followers that they basically uh, denied the existence of, of Hashem. So Hashem says, OK, your existence will be you, you're going to no longer appear before anybody. Nobody. You're going to just it's, disappear. Exactly. That's what I was thinking. It's like he's down there. It's like. Uh, is there a number to call? <laughs> no, your your case is well disposed of. Who exactly are you going to complain to? There is no office for you right. to complain to because you said there is no office. Yeah. So you know that very cryptic teaching in the chapters of the fathers about the things that were created uh, at dusk, a series of things mm-hmm. that are elusive and that are kind of like, uh, they're, they're, they're like, they straddle both worlds for mm-hmm. so the mouth of the donkey, the mouth of the, of the earth, right. Moshe's staff, these, these things that were, that were created, Bain Hashmashot is the expression in Hebrew, which means literally, uh, it literally means between the suns, but, it, but it means that at, at the time of dusk, like it's kind of like a, 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 a period of time, which is uh, imperceptible, which is between night and day. So that, so that's when Hashem created uh, certain things. And I think what one of the, and it's very, very deep teaching. One of the things that it conveys is this concept of a connection between worlds, a connection between heaven and earth yeah. and the ability to be able to connect between heaven and earth, which is so important for the Torah experience. And that's one of the things is so deep. That's one of, that's basically what Korach was denying that we can connect between between heaven and earth, and again, all of this is on the on the tail of uh, last week's um, last week's rebellion of the sin of the spies, which basically changed everything. That's what I always see in this teaching of the things that were created in the twilight of creation is that God is mapping out the world and mapping out creation and connecting all the dots in his massive blueprint. He has a plan and and that this is what Korach denied. He he completely politicized the entire process. Uh, You're saying something incredibly deep. And look at it this way. He Okay, like you say, he denied that God has a plan. Where did that come from? It came from the the problem that he had that he was not satisfied with him, with his own self image mm-hmm. as compared to someone else. So so that shows us right away that there's this there's this connection between the way a person views themselves and the way the per, the person views the universe and and Hashem. And again, the amazing thing is that he he started out being such a, an important person. As a matter of fact, um, I know you wanted to talk about the haftara this week which yeah. is from the book of Samuel, which by the way, every Sunday, our listeners are invited to join our Sunday Zoom class, which right now is focusing on the book of Samuel. We're having a wonderful time going very, very slowly and learning um, the first, uh, we're still, we're about to start the second chapter of the book of Samuel. So the thing is that uh, Korach is actually an antecedent of Samuel. Mm-hmm. And the connection we see with the Haftorah pointing to the prophet Samuel, it highlights the differences between Korah and his descendant, this this blessed prophet Samuel, whose love of God and love of, of righteousness, Samuel 
much like I think much like the Rambam who you just quoted was able to balance the mystical with with the reality of everyday living. And here is a man who, unlike Korah, he did not rebel against the leadership of Israel. In fact, he was the one that anointed two kings of Israel and he supported the leadership of Israel, even even when one of them kind of went off on his own, which, is, of course, is King Shaul, King Saul. And and here is here is uh, Samuel connected to a king who he anointed and said, I support you as God's leadership of, of our nation. And yet what happens is Saul rejects that 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 word by saying, uh, oh, well, you know, why waste all these this good livestock? And, oh, and by the way, why why waste a perfectly good uh, king? King. <laughs> <laughs> because he was because he allowed himself to become emotionally involved and he allowed himself to 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 um, interpolate his own perspective. Yeah. On the situation about which we are taught from King Saul, from what happened with Amalek, whoever is merciful to the cruel will end up being cruel to the merciful. And because he spared Agag, Haman was born. And and again, I just want everybody to know that we're doing a very, very in-depth study of Samuel every Sunday on Zoom. And you can you can join us and get the Zoom log information by emailing rabbi at rabbirichmond.com. We'd love to have you. The thing is that Samuel was critical of the people's desire to have a king. Mm-hmm. And that ne- needs to be understood. And that yeah. has to do, again, the parallel in b- between the Haftarah and our Parsha is the concept of leadership, the concept of pure leadership. Samuel was critical partly because of the way that they asked. I mean, I, I, God himself commanded that Israel appoint a king when they come into the land, but it was, the, it was their desire to have a king like all the other nations. Right. The materialism that corrupted Korach's thinking and his belief and his place in in the scheme of of God's plan, because we know he was a very rich person uh, when they were living in Egypt. He was he was uh, he, he wasn't in bondage because he was a Levite, so he he actually amassed a lot of great wealth. And we're seeing this even today with the Bill Gates of the world. When you have all the wealth you ever want, then you want power. Power, exactly. Hungry for the power. So I started to say that, that, that um, there's a famous teaching of our sages that's, that uh, Korach, what tripped him up was that he had a certain vision because he had a, he had a certain kind of uh, prophetic insight. Mm-hmm. He, he had a vision. And the vision was he saw, that, but he couldn't put his finger on it, but he saw that in the future, a, a great line of great men would descend from him. And uh, so he thought, and he saw Samuel in the future. This is, a, this is kind of like a mystical reason for the, mm-hmm. for the Haftarah being this week, the reading in Samuel. He saw that Samuel the prophet is going to descend from him. So he said to himself basically like, oh, I'm, I'm a very important person. I am uh, um, uh, intrinsically imperative. The cat's meow. I am definitely not. I am here to stay because yeah. Samuel is an important person and he's going to anoint the king of Israel and he comes from me. And the mistake what, that he made was, because that's all he saw. He saw a vision. It wasn't clear. But the rub of it is, yes, he, Samuel is his descendant, but through his sons, yes. his sons survived. There's, yeah. And this is just a, such an interesting thing that we mentioned in the Zoom class. You know, you know that, okay, Korach had his immediate family and his, his immediate cohorts, and then he had the 250. So the 250 members of the elders of Israel, they perished in the, in the fire of the, of the incense. But, his, but Korach's immediate circle, they're the ones that descended alive into into uh, the maw of the earth, right? But the thing is, you notice that in Chronicles, for example, the lineage of Korach is given. There was a, a Levite singer named Haman, not Haman, Haman, who descended from Korach. But more importantly, Jim, there's, there's many, many Psalms in the book of Psalms that are written by the sons of Korach that say, Lamanatzeach to the conductor, Mizmor for the sons of Korach. Yeah. Right? Remember? So yeah, of course. So what happened is, according to our sages, they teach you, you see that, da- that David, who was the main composer of the majority of the Psalms, but also served as the editor for earlier Psalms that had been written. For example, Psalm 92, a song for the Sabbath day, is written by Adam HaRishon, by Adam himself. And David 
uh, inserted into the collection of psalms the older psalms that he had received also. There are some that are written by Moshe, and there are some that are written by Korach. So what happened is that it's all, it's all going down. The showdown is going down. And Korach's sons were in a very difficult situation because they basically had to make a choice between their father and their teacher. And how could they side against their father? That's not, that's not nice, nice Jewish boy. You're not supposed to go against uh, honor your father and your mother. But on the other hand, you're supposed to respect your teacher. And they made their decision and they realized that, that their father was totally wrong. And they mm -hmm. saw, sided with Moshe and they were not included. And by the way, again, the sages employ such incredible imagery when they teach us the deep secrets of the Torah. So here's, here's a midrash that they tell us, open up your heart in the deepest way. They tell us that when that mouth opened, Actually, many mouths opened. I don't know, kind of like a, a spout with slanted sides or like a sieve. But in any event, what do they tell us? They tell us that if, if a person from Korach's uh, um, gang was on the other side of town, meaning on the other side of the camp of Israel in the desert, he would, he would also go down wherever he was. And if a person uh, from Korach's uh, bunch lent someone something, that item would disappear. Let's say, and the Midrash says particularly, a needle. Yeah. <laughs> Anything that would be in someone's possession that belonged to the Korach people. And if a person, let's say, had a document having reference to one of them because they had some kind of a, a loan or something, the name would disappear from the document. So it would, mm. they all went down no matter where they were. And again, our sages employ this incredible, powerful imagery and the question of whether or not it's, it, it, it be, many people misunderstand Midrash because they say, how could this happen? You know, they, then they say, this is all fantasy and, and, um, and anecdotal because people don't understand that it's not meant to be understood literally. You need the skill, the skill set to understand that Midrash is a poetic device. And so what this is teaching me is that when it has your name on it, you can't escape it. Right. When I share has made his decision, you can't escape it, right? And whether or not, again, it's literal is immaterial to me. Maybe it is, but the point is you can't escape it. But anyway, the point is that I brought up with the, with the sons is that the time came and they made their choice and they removed themselves and they did not go down. And, uh, and that's, what, that's what Korach inadvertently saw without understanding is that, is, yes, Samuel is going to come into the world through his sons. Isn't there also a story about one of the wives who saved her husband? Um, I'm trying to remember which which of the, the leaders yes. changed his mind because his yes. wife uh, he was going. He, she was washing her washing her hair. She, she sat in the she sat in the entrance. Oh, the the the, the wife of own Ben Pellet. Yeah, she sat in the entrance and she uncovered her hair so that uh, when they saw that she was sitting uh, immodestly, uh, they came to pick him up to bring him to the showdown. But when they saw that she was sitting there blocking the way, they they wouldn't bother because they were very very religious. So you mm -hmm. get it, and so they didn't want to bother. Yeah. So instead, they left him, and she saved him. Yeah, it's kind of a, it, you could, if it was a musical, she'd be borrowing a song from South Pacific and sa singing, I'm going to wash that man. I knew right you out of my say head. that. <laughs> Mary, Mary Martin, Mary yeah. Martin. Now, what year was that, Jim? Uh, well, the movie or the Broadway play? I, I, is, are any, is, do we even have one listener that is familiar with South Pacific? I remember that. I'm going to wash that man right out of my head. Right? <laughs> that, that, that man in this would be Korach, you know, basically right. to, to send them fleeing, you know. These are guys that were rebelling against the, the appointed leader and yet a woman washing her hair they go, whoa, Jim, whoa, we that's can't. That's the whole point. The, 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 yeah. That's the point of what the sages are trying to say here is the hypocrisy. Right. Of, of and, and, and unfortunately, this is something that we also can relate to. People can be hypocritical. So the idea is they put on these airs of being so pious that, oh, I'm, I'm not going to look over there. There's a woman sitting with her hair uncovered. I'm, oh, God forbid. I'm, but their whole point is rebellion against Hashem altogether. But, they, but they're putting on this, this, um, this air, this, this, they're posing yeah. as if they're very concerned about the minutia of Jewish law. Right. When actually, that, that wasn't it at all. Jim, I wanted to bring this home also to a, to something that, because uh, the more we study the the concept of what happens here, which is so so amazing, and it, you know it's it's part of the Torah, 
And I don't think it's just history at all. I don't, I don't think it's the story of uh, like some Bible critics, um, you know, making an issue. Oh, this is the world's first uh, recorded uh, rebellion against authority. That, that none of that is the issue here, but, but Torah is timeless. And the reason that these lessons are given to us is to change our lives. And, and what, one of the things that our sages mm -hmm. emphasize as they develop the thread of understanding is how he went from being motivated by his desire for honor and his, and his ego, which was just tremendously, tremendously massive. But that led him to a place where he basically disconnected from God altogether and, and felt there can't be even a God in the world. And I don't, I don't even believe that God created this world. And, and that's what emboldened him. So I, I wanted to bring this home to a place that is, I think, so important for all of us, for Jews and non-Jews, all of us who love Hashem and all of our listeners, because what really Parshat Korach boils down to is a question of emunah, a question of our belief and our faith in Hashem. And the interesting thing that I see here that the Torah is emphasizing is the, is the um, connection between the way one views oneself and the way one ultimately views the world. Yeah. By the way, this is one of the things we've discussed in the past also regarding how Maimonides writes in his philosophical works about, you know, how did idolatry first creep into the family of man? If he asked the question of if Adam HaRishon, if Adam was actually created by, by God himself, that's a, a strong tradition to pass down to your children. So why is it that in, in the first parsha of Breshit, in the very first Torah portion, by the, by the time we reach the, the end, you know, we get to 10 generations, the world was so corrupt that Hashem wanted to wipe it up because of the, of idolatry. And so he, ta Rambam talks about how man began to, began to look at himself in a very, um, disparate way, it, it, it just not as as a unit, but as as a as a bundle of different uh, forces and different powers, loosely connected, and there and therefore he looked at the world that way. Also, oh, there's sun and moon and stars and wind and all sorts of different things. So that there's actually a very very beautiful verse that applies to this whole concept that we might have spoken about before. Bears repeating, and that is in Esther, in Esther, chapter two, when uh, when Mordechai is first introduced onto the scene in the story of Esther, in chapter two and um, verse five, in right. Esther two five, all of a sudden we read there was a Jewish man in Shushan, the capital, whose name was Mordechai, son of Yair, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjamite who had been exiled from Jerusalem, etc. And so the question is asked, why is he called Ish Yehudi, a Jewish, Jewish man? man. If, the, if the verse elaborates further and, and to, explains to us that he is from the tribe of Benjamin. So first of all, if, he's, if the verse is telling us that he's from the tribe of Benjamin, it's superfluous to tell us that he was Ish Yehudi, a Jewish man. And second of all, it's not even accurate because if he was from Binyamin, he can't really be called Yehudi at that time because Yehudi meant at that time still from Yehuda. Mm -hmm. But he had his lineage. Now we're all called Yehudi because we're all considered to be from Yehuda, except for the Levites and the Kohanim. But at that time, he had his lineage from Benjamin. So why is he called Yehudi? So Chazal tell us in a very, very deep lesson that they, they employ one of the methodologies of Torah study and they they employ this approach saying that the letters can be, certain letters can be interchanged. And they say, don't, don't read that as a hey, read it as a chet. Don't read it as ish yehudi, but ish yehudi, which means singular. Oh. He was a singular man, a unique man and change the chet. It's kind of like a play on words, but it's, yeah. a, it's, in a, it's a level of, of interpretation. And they say, read it as Yehudi. Why? They say, open up your heart in the deepest way. Why? Because Hashem said to him, because you made me one in the world, I testify that you are one in the world. Amen. Because you made me one, you're one. It's like that verse in Ezekiel, the famous verse that where, where Hashem says, one was Abraham. My point being that, that you see that there is a strong connection between the way a person feels about oneself 
and feels about Hashem. And the, the greatest impediment to a connection to Hashem, and, the, and we learn this so clearly from Korach, is ego. Yeah. Because yeah. Because it's like, it's like, and I mentioned this in the video this week, like a person that is on that level of, of self-promotion is like, there's not enough room in this town for both of us. Me, right. me and God. It's just not one of us has to go. He says to God, "It's going to have to be you." I don't. There's no room here. Yeah, it shows you that idolatry is uh, still very much alive in the world, and as it was in Korach's day, because because <clears throat> people like Korah basically embrace the the most uh, desirable idol of all, and that is themselves. And he, and he, again, there's no question about the fact that it's universally accepted and emphasized. This was a tremendously great man, but yet in the end, he fell victim to his own self-aggrandizement. To, yeah. And it came, and, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it and it got to the to the ridiculous extent that he was comfortable denying denying God altogether. And that's why he had this unique punishment because basically he was. If you pardon me, he was grounded <laughs> because Hashem, Hashem was like, you don't understand. You need to be grounded like a father needs to teach a, a belligerent child because because he didn't just simply rebel against Moshe's authority. It was against what Moshe represents, which is that the Torah is of, is of divine authorship and was given from heaven. And ultimately, that led him to deny God's existence altogether because because he couldn't cope with with any competition at all. It was his world. It had to be his world. And uh, that's why the opening of the earth's mouth was was this uh, incredibly um, divinely appointed indication. Uh, that Hashem chose Moshe as his agent and was and, and was only operating by his command. Doesn't this give us a template, uh, an acid test, Rabbi, to uh, to test leadership in our lives when we have people running for president or for city council or for prime minister of Israel? Isn't... <laughs> no, I was hoping I was hoping we could get through this show without bringing up what's going on in Israel. Well, we don't have to. I just want to say that 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 this lesson, the the, the lessons that I personally learned from this, Barsha, uh, showed me how to test leadership, because ultimately there will come a time in Israel, and in fact, it should be right now, that that Amazing. that people like Korah, uh, the things that happened to him because what he desired, everything was about what he wanted. And even though he, even though he positioned himself as a leader who was interested in what you wanted, what do you want? What can I do for you as a leader? <laughs> and yet what the, the 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 person who arrives on the scene in in Israel who is going to take a leadership role, the people of Israel need to ask him um, uh, prime minister or prime ministerial candidate, what do you want? That's the, that's what they should say. What do you want? And I think that the 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 one that should be voted for will be the one that says, "What does God want?" Again, it's the. I'm sorry, I'm getting choked up. <clears throat> it's the Haftorah. It's the yeah. story of 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 who a king should be. It's. It, I, I'm not giving an endorsement. I'm mm -hmm. just answering your question. In my opinion, the only person worthy is a person who only cares about Hashem who doesn't care about international pressure, who doesn't care about what's politically correct, who doesn't care about false promises and false alliances, but who only cares about uh, Hashem's word and Hashem's yeah. promises. Yeah, that's the mistake that Saul made. The people said to, to King Saul, we want to be like the nations. Right. And he, he should have turned to them uh, with and his then, and then later he used the same excuse. He said to he said to Samuel, he said the people had yeah. mercy on Agag. That's why we have this clear link between Korah and Moses and King Saul and and the prophet Samuel, all the way down to Haman and Esther. I was thinking also, Jim, that um, the, another famous teaching from Pirkei Avot, the chapters of the fathers, at, uh, chapter three, Rabbi Hanina, the assistant high priest, taught. Pray for the welfare of the government, for without fear of the government, people would swallow each other alive. So, so um, yes, we definitely need a, a good government so that there'll be 
law and order. But the benchmark of, of um, leadership is will always be Moshe. Yeah. And who had no personal agenda whatsoever other than being a conduit for Hashem's will for the people. He yeah. could have cared less about himself. It was never about himself. And then on the contrary, what we see from Exodus 32, 32 is that he said, just if you, if you don't have mercy on your people, just take my name out of the book. I wanted to ask you also, Jim, what, what do you have to say about the, um, well, the whole connection here with, uh, you know, the, the concept of the incense offering that, that I see as a, as a tikkun for Nadav and Avihu, first of all, because they had offered that incense, which was unsolicited. And here the incense became the tool for uh, the determination of Hashem's will, which of course, anyway, we learn in very deep lessons about the power of the incense offering, what it represents in Hashem's eyes, how it represents unity and harmony and how important it is. So he, he chose that as the, as the um, device, but, but then, I find it very fascinating that uh, this whole idea of um, the, another proof, in, in other words, okay, it, it was already proven who, who was who because the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed Korah. <laughs> that doesn't happen every day. But yet another proof was necessary and that was the proof of Aaron's status. Yeah. And so, and so the, the tool for, that, for determining that was uh, the blossoming of Aaron's road. A rod, excuse me, his rod. Now, a lot of people are not aware, but the um, we are taught that each staff was identical and all the rods of wood were cut from the same length. And the same they tree. Different, different. Yes, they were all, and from the same piece, they were all dry and they were all lifeless. Mm -hmm. And uh, and as Shem said in verse um, chapter 17, verse 20, and Hashem said, and it shall be that the man that I will choose, his staff will blossom. Thus I shall cause to subside from me, uh, from upon me the complaints of the children of Israel, whom they complain against you. So, so um, what, is the, what is the almond blossom really representative of? It is the first fruit to blossom in the land of Israel. Uh, it is also um, a concept of speed, shakade. The word means means like um, uh, quickly, and it also represents a constant renewal and rebirth, basically life and hope. The, uh, this iconography of the, of this dry stick blossoming, representing Aaron, is the opposite of Korach because Korach was about. Uh, 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 Dryness, he's had division and animosity and jealousy and bitterness. But the point is, what is Hashem trying to show by Aaron's stick blossoming with, with, with almond flowers is that this one who is desired by Hashem to serve his interests in the world is, a, and don't forget, Aaron's whole uh, MO in the world, his, what is he identified with? He's identified with peace. He's the peacemaker, right? Again, chapters of the fathers, be of the students of of uh, um, Hillel. Hillel said in chapter five, uh, in chapters of the fathers, be of the disciples of Aaron, a lover of peace, a pursuer of peace, one who loves the, all creation and draws them close to Torah. So, so here, uh, uh, Aaron's soul, what, the, 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 the almond blossom is, is showing that the soul of Aaron is a soul of growth and blossoming mm -hmm. and wanting to increase good and blessing in the world. That's what grows forth from, from, from peace between people, which of course brings to peace between man and God. And Korach is the opposite of, of all of that. Isn't there also a connection between the physical uh, properties of the almond tree itself? The limbs are supposed to be very straight, very, very upright, so to speak. I had heard that, yeah. And not only that, but there's, there are several other very deep secrets regarding the almond, the almond um, rods and, and Aaron's having uh, blossomed as a testimony to his character. Um, because the verse tells us that Aaron's staff, and I quote, it's just such an amazing verse, gave forth blossoms, sprouted buds, and produced ripe almonds. All at once. Yeah. In, a, in other words... 
In other words, all the stages of growth were taking place simultaneously from this dry wood. Three stages of growth, blossoming and sprouting buds and producing ripe almonds because it's, it's, it's almost as if uh, it's a sign that, that um, he's, his, he's never done, Aaron. In other words, like it's, 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 he's constantly renewed. He's always starting over again in his service of Hashem, again, from because of his own humility. It's like even at the time of blossom, which is like the very first little bit that comes out, it's budding and bearing fruit simultaneously. And then he's beginning again, again, beginning anew again. Um, and that has to do with it, with the aspect of the verse that, that, that tells us, Hashem says, I will choose. But Korah's complaint was, was because of the fact that Aaron had already been chosen. And yet Hashem is using future tense, even though he already made his choice. And that is, reflects this idea that, it, that Aaron's growth is constant which again, it's absolutely the opposite of Korah, who is the dry rod that has finished growing and has no use to grow further because he is stuck in, in, in where he is, which ultimately resulted in him really being stuck. And the message is basically don't get swallowed up by the earth. Yeah. Um, no, <laughs> words, really. No, words really. To, yeah, words to live by. Of course, I, of course, I mean figuratively, but of course, but yeah. yeah. Don't allow yourself because because what swallowed him up was his own um, self indulgence, mm -hmm. his own yeah. self worship. Yeah, and that's that again. It, it, God is giving us the the uh, the acid test for for true leadership on whatever level of of uh, a person's life. And I think it's it bespeaks it there, and I I can't. It, it's amazing that you you told us about the story of the ground opening up in in Jerusalem, and <laughs> and and also that we have you know that again there's a there's a, a a striving over the leadership of the nation of Israel this very moment. It's quite telling. Again, my prayer, my blessing, my my heart's desire, my tears are only that we should merit to a leader who puts Hashem's agenda above his own, um, who puts Hashem's people above his own fears of the reaction of the world. Um, that's the leadership that Israel needs. Amen. So Be'ezrat Hashem, we shall stay above ground <laughs> and, and bring in the month of Tammuz and may Hashem bring us all opportunities to do our little part for rectifying the sin of the spies during this month wherein they were so busy walking around looking at everything in a bad way. Let us see the good and bring about a great sanctification of Hashem's name which is reflected in the integrity of the land of Israel and let us see good things in each other, in ourselves, in each other, and in the land of Israel. Amen. <laughs>